I bet you that you have probably every couple of hours been looking on your phone or on the news um, and tracking what's going on with Hurricane Irma and um, fearing for the well-being of friends and family and strangers um, in her wake. And I bet you you've been thinking, too, about all of the people in Bangladesh and Nepal and India and in California. It seems like um, it's been a time of catastrophe. And it doesn't only seem like it's been catastrophes of fire and hurricane and mudslide, but somehow I feel lately deep in my bones, in fact, all summer, it feels like a time of, of human catastrophe where strangers are not welcome and um, where the poor are forgotten and where people's hope is being taken away. I'm feeling that and I'm carrying with me that it lingers. But as I've been watching Irma, um, I've also had this memory in the back of my head of being very small and my parents had, my grandparents had a trailer in the Pine Barrens in Jackson. And I had this dim memory of being small with them and knowing that a great big hurricane was coming. And living in a trailer when a hurricane comes is sort of a scary predicament. And I remember lining up with them. There was a water truck that came, and we had the big gallon, empty gallons um, jugs, and we were filling them with water because we figured we weren't going to have water for a while. And I remember them making preparations, and I remember that the hurricane was coming at night. And I remember them out in the living room and hearing them talking, this murmuring in the back that I could almost not hear at all because of the screaming outside of the wind. And as I lay there in my bed, and this is a sense that's hard to describe, I was old enough to know that being in the middle of a hurricane, in a trailer, in the middle of the woods, um, is a dangerous thing. And I wasn't young enough to think that there wasn't any danger. I knew there was. But somehow laying there in my bed, I trusted in my grandparents' love as being bigger than anything that was going on around the trailer. And I can't tell you what that meant. I didn't think it necessarily meant that I was always going to be safe, but I had this trust in that love that gave me this sense of peace. Well, I'm sure my grandfather and my grandmother were freaking out <laughs> in the living room, you know. And I think that they were worried in the living room because that's who I am now. I'm the adult. And I have that memory of being a child and trusting in this love that was big in a way that, was, that dwarfed everything else that could hurt you. Um, but that's largely receded for me as a grown-up. Except, by the way, when I'm in church. Church really reminds me of that trailer where we have that sense of that love that dwarfs the size of things that we think are bigger than it. Yeah? Um, but I know that I'm really a person. I think it's just part of my nature. I worry a lot. Um, and I'm absolutely worried about the world. And I worry about it all the time. And I notice that when I'm worrying, my God shrinks. Have you ever noticed that? The bigger my worry, the smaller my God. I'm going to take you to the Old Testament lesson for a second. Because I think that this lesson from Exodus is for me at this moment... And I would imagine it's also for you. Here we have the instructions, like it's almost on the back of a cake mix. The instructions are about how you are to celebrate the Passover. 
and there's talk about the slaughtering of the sheep and the, how you're supposed to eat, reclining, and the bread, and all of this stuff. And probably you all know that the instructions for the celebration of Passover have to do with being mindful of the times, the times, plural, but in this case the time, that God delivered you from slavery into freedom. Here's the quirky thing about the Passover instructions this morning. In the body of the story of Exodus, the instructions for how to remember when God delivered you from slavery into freedom, those instructions occur before anybody gets anywhere near crossing through the Red Sea. It has not happened yet. People are still in Egypt. Pharaoh has taken away the straw to make the bricks. It is a time of hardship and terror and helplessness in Egypt. Right in the middle of that, before God has delivered any of the Hebrews, he says, listen to you very closely. I'm going to tell you how to celebrate your deliverance and gives these elaborate instructions about how to do it. And at the very end of the story, maybe you notice what God says, I want your children and your children's children to celebrate this feast. And this feast is going to mark the beginning of the year for you. Maybe on your calendar it says the beginning of the year is January, but not for the people of God. For the people of God, the beginning of your year is remembering when God delivered you. So here's the question. Why is God asking the people of Israel to celebrate their deliverance before it even happened? When they're actually living in the middle of terror? I think this is the reason. I think the reason is Whenever we lived, whether it was 3,500 years ago or 200 years from now or someplace in the middle, what God is telling you is that the deliverance that God is giving us from slavery into freedom is right now. And never think that that story from 3,500 years ago happened to somebody else's family thousands and thousands of years ago. What God is saying, and this happens in worship, it happens in liturgy, it happens right here, the deliverance we're talking about didn't happen to somebody else, it happened to you. You were delivered from slavery into freedom. You were delivered from death and hopelessness and helplessness into life. When you receive the bread and the wine at this table in 15 minutes, the words that are going to be spoken in your ear are not the body of Christ given to somebody else 2,000 years ago. The words you are going to hear are the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, right? It's a present tense experience. And it happens right in the eye of the storm. Whatever the storm is, your deliverance comes right in the middle. So that's who the people of God are in the middle of times of helplessness and fear. They're the people who remember in a tissue memory kind of way who God is to them in this moment. And they live accordingly, which makes you look weird in the middle of a crisis. I'm going to give you an example. Look at the Matthew text this morning. This is another wonderful text. Here we have something that sounds like bylaws for how to run a church. And Jesus is saying, look, if somebody offends you in the church, you take them aside privately and you explain to them what they've done wrong. And if they don't listen to you, then bring two or three people with you and tell them again what they've done wrong. And if they don't even listen to the two or three, bring the whole church, right? And then Jesus says at the very end, and if they won't listen to the church, 
Treat them like tax collectors and sinners. Think about how Jesus treats tax collectors and sinners for a minute. I should be so lucky to be treated like a tax collector by Jesus. I'm hoping for that when I die. Please, God, treat me like a tax collector and a sinner. Donald just mentioned something really important. This story comes in the middle of Matthew's gospel. Does anyone remember what Matthew was as a job? He was a tax collector. You should be so lucky to be treated the way that Jesus treats tax collectors and sinners. I think, oh, and you should know this too. Just before this lesson, Jesus is talking about, he's telling the story about the, the good shepherd who goes and finds the lost sheep and leaves the 99. And then right after this, next Sunday, you want to guess what's coming up? Peter says, yeah, but really, Jesus, how many times do we have to forgive? Is seven good? And Jesus says, no, you try 70 times seven. So here's one of the things, it, I know this for some of you who aren't ex-generation people, you might not understand. Jesus speaks to my heart in a way as an ex-generation person. I can't, he is sarcastic, I think. You know, I mean, this just sounds to me like my group. Anyway, he's being funny, at least, minimally, right? I think he is. But our constant refrain, and what Peter is going to say on our behalf next Sunday, is Jesus, this idea about forgiving people, I understand it's beautiful, it's, but you just don't understand how bad it is out there. Because you haven't read this morning's paper. And you didn't listen to the news, apparently. I mean, we're really past the point of love and forgiveness, and we need something more than that. So we're coming back to you to say, let's say that that doesn't work. What else do you have for us? And he just keeps returning us to it, doesn't he? To forgiveness and to love. And one of the things I think that happens in the scripture next week, when Jesus is telling Peter to forgive 70 times 7, is when we turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, we just don't think that works. What Jesus says to us is, well, how much have you tried it? How much time have you invested in forgiveness and in love? And here's another question. How much has the world tried it? I don't know whether we've given enough of a test drive to know whether or not it works, but I'll tell you what. The other question we have to ask ourselves is, how big is our Jesus? You're about to stand up in a minute and recite the Nicene Creed, which is very cryptic. I'm still trying to figure out what it all means, but I can understand one thing that it means. When I stand up with you, what I'm going to say is that I believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. There's no comma or semicolon. Period. That once we are baptized into our life with Christ, sins are forgiven. And Jesus also tells us that we have the power to release sins. He said it in the text this morning. And the question is, do you believe in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Is your God big enough to redeem and forgive this entire world. When you look at a storm in front of you, do you turn to God and say, God, this storm is so terribly big? Or when you look at a storm, do you tor turn to the storm and do you say, storm? You just don't have any idea how big my Jesus is. Brothers and sisters, when you feel fear eating away at your faith in God's love, I want you to remember who you really are and the God that delivered you out of slavery into life out of sin into hope 
and into love. And when you receive the body and blood of Christ in a couple of minutes, that wasn't meant for anybody else. That's meant for you now. You have the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you're sent out into that world that believes that God isn't big enough to say, you just haven't met my God yet. Amen. Amen.